We have Robert in the house today. Robert's a very interesting guy. He is currently building a company that is automating the entire process of buying branded merchandise online. And um, yeah, Robert, maybe you can talk about yeah, that. Sure. But, but before that, uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about your background. Yeah. Where you're from, where yeah. were you born, and how did you end up in Singapore? Singapore? Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, thanks Vikram for having me on the show. I think it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> um, oh, come on, don't be so far about <laughs> So now I'll tell you like a bit more about, so about me, like where I came from, how I discovered uh, Drapers first as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was born in Sri Lanka in, in 1991. Um, the war kicked off, it was, it was the peak of the war and war kicked off in 95. This is so the civil, the civil, civil war in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. Uh, and 95, the army pretty much invaded Jaffna, so we all had to flee. So we like left our homes and moved to, to the jungles in Klinochi. And, and you were, how old were you? I was five. Wow. Yeah. So, so you, were, you were in the jungles at five? At five, yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah, tell yeah, us yeah. more so about this. That, that's, so it's crazy. I think, so when, when I was born there, um, things were a bit like so the Jaffna, and so Sri Lanka looks like a mango, right? So. Um, the top, the north and the east is where the Tamils have lived, is the mm -hmm. Tamil homeland. And then you've got the, the Sinhalese who live in the south. And there was issues, once the British left, there was issues between the two communities. Uh, and things got really heated, so, you know, there was a civil war where the Tamils were fighting for a separate state. Um, so we got caught in between all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so in 1995, uh, the, 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 the rebels controlled much of the north and east and uh, the government wanted to take back control so they came in so they come when they when armies move into a place they come in with a lot of noise so a lot of bombings a lot of shootings um, and we were just given like a couple of hours to leave so we've had like you probably know these um uh like rickshaws or autos right there's mm -hmm. like tuk-tuks mm -hmm. so those i remember that day when those autos went around jaffna announcing that like we can't hold off the army anymore. So you mm -hmm. need to grab as anything you can get, like grab everything you have and leave as soon as possible. So at that time, the population of Jaffna was like half a million people. So everyone literally grabbed onto like bits of food, mm -hmm. any gold they have, like, you know, being Asian, mm -hmm. we, that's the wealth they collect, right? right? That's the only thing you can carry away mm -hmm. and like a huge amount of the cash. So I remember my mom like, she had a bag full of cash, like all the gold and some food to take away. And then we started, we started walking because like, because they weren't like, we had, we had a car, but like, we can't really move because it's mm -hmm. like half a million people on the street. So we moved from Jaffna to, to the jungles where, where the rebels were, it was more safer there. So we lived there for six months. Um, and my, my brother was born there. Um, and from there we left to the capital. Which is Colombo. Um, Colombo, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went to school there for, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And like towards the beginning of like 2000s, we left Sri Lanka. So we went from Sri Lanka to Indonesia, lived in Indonesia for a year, um, and then to Thailand, to China, and then from China to, um, to Finland. And when we arrived in Finland, the authorities realized we were traveling on forged documents. So, and then they realized that we were refugees from Sri Lanka that fleeing the war. Mm -hmm. So they were like, well, you don't really need to go anywhere. You can stay here. Mm -hmm. So they put us in a refugee camp. So we spent like me, my mom and my brother, we spent six months in a refugee camp in Finland. Uh, that was a crazy experience for me because that's like the first time I'm in like a cold country. I'm mm -hmm. so used to Jeff now, which is like hot and, and, and different. And it's the first time I'm seeing snow. I'm seeing people of like other color and other nationalities. Um, and that was really like interesting experience. And then from there, we somehow like managed to escape the refugee camp, mm -hmm. got on a plane to, to the UK. And then my dad was already in the UK. He left slightly earlier than us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how I ended up in the UK. So I arrived there wow. early, early 2000s. So you, so too early, so you're like, you were 10 years old, 11, uh, 12, nine, nine. You're nine yeah, years yeah, old yeah, yeah. when, Wow, this is wild story. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> There's so, th I have so many questions. Okay. I've heard about the Sri mm -hmm. Lankan civil unrest, uh -huh. and, I, and I actually know a couple of friends who have sort of yeah. gone through probably something similar mm -hmm. to you, but in different parts of the world. Yeah. They ended yeah. up in yeah. say, Australia yeah. Yeah. or somewhere yeah. else. But I actually don't know the history yeah. of Sri Lanka. Yeah. 
So maybe like briefly, you can tell us the history of Sri Lanka. Yeah. Why was there a civil unrest? Mm -hmm. And I've heard things like there were two different types of Tamils yeah. in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were like the Indian Tamils, yeah. and then there were a different type yeah, of Tamils. The Ilam Tamils yeah, yeah. So maybe you can unpack just Very a little briefly. bit of the yeah, history yeah, yeah. Uh, of why the civil unrest happened. Yeah. So uh, I think to kind of summarize, because we, we have like 30 years of history on that island. Right. So, so Sri Lanka is like right next to India, right next to the state of Tamil Nadu in, uh, in, in India. And so it used to be part of India at some point or no? No, no, no. It, was it was always a, it was always a separate state. Mm -hmm. But um, people, the people that lived in the state of Tamil Nadu mm -hmm. and Kerala were very similar to the people of, that live in the north and east. Uh, of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. so, so Sri Lanka has always had um, two main groups, ethnic groups on that mm -hmm. island. So Tamils who have always lived on the island for, for thousands and thousands of years mm -hmm. uh, will generally tend to live in the north and east of the island. Mm -hmm. And then you had Sinhalese who mm -hmm. lived generally in the south, uh, south and more central parts of, mm -hmm. uh, of of Sri Lanka. So those are the two main groups. So Sinhalese, so the Tamils are of Tam the, the descendants of yeah. people from like Tamil Nadu. No, 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 that no, 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 no. I think we're just like Tamils, that's usually the misconception just mm. because the population of Tamils in India are much higher. Right. We've always lived on the island. It could have been that it, it could have been the other way around. Right. They could have went from Sri Lanka to India. Right. So because the sheer population of Tamils in that area, people miss think that we came from India. Right. I'll get to the second uh, group of people in a second. Yeah. So we've got the Tamils who are called Ulam Tamils or Ceylonese mm -hmm. and we live in the north and east and mm -hmm. that's our traditional homeland. And then you've got a Sinhalese in the south mm -hmm. um, and they've lived there quite some time as well. Mm -hmm. And then the third group of people is a slightly different, again the Tamil speaking people who are brought in from India. So parts of mm -hmm. uh, India like Tamil Nadu, Kerala and mm -hmm. Andhra Pradesh or mostly from Tamil Nadu, uh, like the plantation workers. So they were brought to Sri Lanka in the plantation um, like estates to work right. there as workers, and they still live there. So like tea, sugar tea, cane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly tea. Right. So they do all the tea plantation, and yeah. they live more in the central part of mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka. They speak a slightly different uh, dialect to us, um, but we're pretty much the same people, but they, they were the ones who came from India. We've always existed right. on the island. Mm -hmm. So the, pro the, the, the issue starts here is, Pre, so when the British came, there was two, so the first, the Portuguese came, the Dutch came, and then the British came. When they came, there was two main kingdoms on the island. You had the Tamils who lived in the, as their own people and own state in the mm -hmm. north and east, and then you had the Singhalese who lived in the south. Because of the, the administration and the way the British Empire works, they like to bring things together or divide. So That's what they've done is they made it into one country mm -hmm. and called it uh, Ceylon, mm -hmm. to be called Ceylon. So when the British left, they obviously like to, they don't always leave things in good places. Mm -hmm. they, um, they gave the, the, the power to the majority of the population, which mm -hmm. was the Sinhalese. And this is like uh, British left in what, 90, uh, 48, 40, 40, 40, 40, yeah, yeah, okay. so like that. during the, uh, um, yeah. the independence of India, around that time, yeah, yeah, around the same time. Right before, like during World War yeah, II, yeah, they yeah. sort of left. Right. So when they left, they looked at the population and, and they, they left majority of the power with, the, with, with they didn't leave it in a very clean way where they could have had a separate, two separate states, but they made it into one and left it as one, as Ceylon. Mm -hmm. So what happened then was, um, with now you've got a parliament of Sri Lanka as a separate like independent states. Now because Tamils were at that point like a smaller percentage, so mm -hmm. you've got the, the ethnic Ilam Tamils, you've got the Indian Tamils, and mm -hmm. then you've got like Muslims who are also Tamil speaking. Mm -hmm. They formed about, tw the total of that was 25%, and then the Sinhalese was 75%. So in parliament, that was the same representation. So Sinhalese, 75% of the population, yeah. they represented 75% of parliament. Parliament too. And then 25% of the population yeah. is ethnic Tamils or Indian, Indian Tamils, Tamils. And then the Muslims. And some, well. some Muslim, Tamil speaking Muslims. Yeah. Tamil speaking Muslims. And the Sinhalese are what religion? They're uh, Buddhist. So again, um, so it's not really a religion thing mm -hmm. because like Sinhalese there, you can be Buddhist, you can be Christians too. Mm -hmm. Same with Tamils. You can be Muslim, you can be Christian, you mm -hmm. can be Hindu, you can be whatever you like. It's not really a religion thing, it's more of a race and a language mm -hmm. situation. So yeah, they left it at that and then so things started kicking off. So the first thing when the majority Sinhalese parliament came into place was, okay, so we, are, we can see that the Tamils have been trained in English so well and they take up 
pretty much 80 to 90 percent of government jobs and high paid jobs so we're going to do something about that and that was the first point of uh, the, 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 for the first point of ethnic cleansing or the, the, the issue starts here they say singleization meaning they're going to make Sinhalese the official language of Sri Lanka so they're getting right. rid of English and Tamil so that's a big blow to the Tamil population who feel like we're not really represented we can't mm -hmm. speak our language or we can't hold any of these jobs anymore because we were trained and spoken in English mm -hmm. Uh, and again, that gave Tamils a big kind of like advantage because even in places like Malaysia and mm -hmm. uh, si Singapore, the British used to bring the Tamils here right. to do all the admin work because they were well right. worse in English. So that was one issue. And then the Tamils, the MPs, again, revolted, peaceful protest and all that. Second thing uh, was, you know, they started doing colonizations of the homeland. So started settling Sinhalese families in Tamil-like villages. Mm -hmm. Um, so those started agitating people and the third big blow was when they did something called standardization which means that people go into university so if you are a Tamil you need to get like three A's to go to uni to do a course but mm -hmm. if you were like a Sinhalese person you only need to get like A and two B's and you're in so they wanted to have more Sinhalese people go into universities mm -hmm. which felt like it wasn't fair on the students and the students again revolted and started forming groups and by the sort of like 80s, uh, the whole peaceful protest didn't really pay off and the students and the younger people started taking up arms. So there was multiple kind of militant groups that were formed, mm -hmm. you know, some being, you know, LTT, EPRLF, PLOT and a bunch of them. Some funded by, funded and trained by India. So it was Indira Gandhi who was in power mm -hmm. at that time. They heavily funded it. And they uh, funded which groups? So they, they, some of them funded like, so what they used to do was these rebel groups used to go to India um, and in, even to places like Palestine to get training mm -hmm. and India w used to fund them to go and pretty much, you know, fight, mm -hmm. fi fight the government. Um, so that's how the whole war kicked off and it just, all of a sudden you went from having a very successful country that mm -hmm. had so much prosperity and opportunities to turning into a, two divided two nations and mm -hmm. And it's just getting worse now. So, what was India's motive for training and funding the rebels against a majority population? Yeah, I mean, there's two aspects to look at it. One um, is obviously India has a huge, like, 70 million Tamil population in the south, and it's, right. it's quite a quite an important state to India. So that's one aspect to see it. But I see things very differently. If you look at it more from a political point of view. Mm -hmm. India uh, is the, 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 the power nation of South Asia, right? It's the right. big brother. And he wants to have control of all the little mm -hmm. countries, whether that being, you know, like uh, uh, Bangladesh, yeah. uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, all of them. Yeah. And you see, you've seen th the situation when uh, Bangladesh became Bangladesh. It used mm -hmm. to be part of uh, Pakistan, right. right? It used to be right. East Pakistan. So I think Indra Gandhi had that motive and to try and have more control over Sri Lanka. They mm -hmm. saw it as a small piece of land with a 20 million population. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have control over it. Mm -hmm. But th th they didn't, they couldn't really go and like take control over it. Mm -hmm. So they need to find a way to kind of play their cards. And that's when, you know, as the, 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 the race issues start mm -hmm. popping up, it was a great time for them to sneak in. And right. And, and the, the rebel groups mm -hmm. were, I'm supposing, mostly from the ethnic Tamil yeah. uh, and the Indian Tamils, they were they part of uh, any of the that's rebellion? That's a good question. I, again, it's, it's a very good question because I think there's a lot of like misconceptions around it. There's a lot of people that from the estates that mm -hmm. moved to North and East and fought in the war against Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, majority of the, uh, the Indian Tamils who live so further away from the North and East and weren't so connected, um, you know, they would they were so supportive of the movements because we were we were all pretty much the same people. But no, it wasn't an active kind of role, and they've obviously had their own representations in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So it was a slight different. They were supportive, but they didn't actively take part in it. Uh, saying that there's a lot of people who did join the movements and you know gave their lives to the movements. Mm -hmm. um, but again, a huge kind of support came from Tamil Nadu and India at the mm -hmm. early stages of uh, of the war. Right. So the, I guess the contentions started when the British left. Yeah. So like 1948. That's when struggle for power yeah, yeah. started, mm -hmm. but then it kept escalating until 1980. Yeah. 
that's when um, there was armed rebellion yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the minority group, yeah, which was yeah. the, the Tamil, the, yeah. the ethnic Tamil groups. Yeah. And um, the Sinhalese government, was that a military government yeah. or was that a democratic government? Uh, no, it's, it's been, well, on paper it's demo right. democratic, but over the years it's become super militant. Mm -hmm. um, so in the early I think one of the biggest turning points of this whole thing was 1983, mm -hmm. we, we called it Black July. Um, so up north in Jaffna, the, the one of the rebel groups attacked uh, a con uh, like a, um, a van with uh, like soldiers, I think mm -hmm. about 13 soldiers died mm -hmm. and their bodies were sent to the south to Colombo for burial and, mm -hmm. and what the politicians do, did was like blow this up because they weren't really happy with the armies getting killed mm -hmm. by the rebel groups. And what that did was it started off a riot, like it, what turned, went from a riot, meaning people were, mobs were going into destroying Tamil homes in Colombo because mm -hmm. Tamils had a lot of businesses and families were living in the capital. Mm -hmm. Businesses were burned, uh, people were like getting killed and you know, setting people on fire. So they were, the, the message was like, this not, you're not safe here, you got to leave. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people then started fleeing out of the country or fleeing back to the north and east. That was a tipping point. I think 1983 was like, mm -hmm. we're not really safe here anymore. Right. So when you were born, yeah. this was in, like the conflict was mm -hmm. well in the way mm -hmm. of um, escalation. Yeah. Because you were born in 91. Yeah. And your, your parents, like what was, were they, what was their um, status yeah. in, in Sri Lanka? And, uh, so my mom was actually born in Colombo. My granddad used to work on the ships. So their families moved again from another um, racial like riot. So they felt like they wasn't safe for them. They had to sell their homes in Colombo and mm -hmm. move to, to Jaffna. So that's how my mom ended up in Jaffna. My dad's family's always been in Jaffna. They are like from a small village there. Um, and their stands was like, because they were quite young then, like mm -hmm. in 91, they were like 19, 20. So mm -hmm. they were quite like, yeah, I mean, like, they were super supportive of the movement. So, you know, we've had enough of this. We definitely want to s have a separate state. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was their standpoint. And generally, that gets passed on to the next generation and right. so on. Right. And, wow. And so, so when you left in 2000, at that point, how many ethnic Tamils were fleeing the country or had fled the country mm -hmm. already? So I think... Th that was a big chunk of people that left around that time mm -hmm. uh, and then the second set like on, on the final stages of war 2009 is another batch of people so it was over years people are leaving I think I would say about 1.5 million of like Iran Tamils live outside of the homelands and right. about 3.5 live on the island and so this 1.5 million yeah. people uh, outside of Sri yeah. Lanka what generally what countries are so they? uk has mm -hmm. a decent population about mm -hmm. like three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. canada has a big like decent population so generally around toronto um, and then the third probably be france germany mm -hmm. um, italy um, australia has a big chunk mm -hmm. um, even not surprisingly but like malaysia and singapore has mm -hmm. a big chunk mm -hmm. um, yeah those are generally the countries they go to Right. Europe and Australia and then Southeast Asia. And is it because these countries have sort of welcomed um, or have some sort of uh, participation mm. in, in um, assimilation? Like why, why these countries? Uh, I think for two reasons. One, I mean, I think the way to look at it is like you're, you're going to leave everything you have behind, right? right? That's one thing. Secondly, like you're also like if you're leaving everything behind, you're... You, you're going to look for opportunities too. You want to mm -hmm. go to countries where it's safe. Right. Um, is you're going to go to countries where your kids can grow up and will have a much better future. Right. And you're going to go to countries where you're not going to be discriminated or killed again. Right. So for, that, for those things, generally, the West seems to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, that's probably why people tend to go to, to these countries. But secondly, the tricky bit is um, when, you, when people think about like asylum seekers or refugees, the bit that people don't understand so well is like it's not easy to get from a village in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. to to London, for example. It's how do you get? Well, that? your story. <laughs> this is crazy. So, all these countries that you hopped around, yeah. then finally settled in the UK, like Indonesia. Like, 
can you can you share yeah. what that journey was like and why did you end up going to all these countries? Yeah. Um, so, so you uh, you will be granted generally granted asylum or to live in a country once you reach there. Right. So you got to do all the journey on your own. So generally, there's two routes you can do. So from from Sri Lanka to the UK, there's two routes. So generally, you can go on a land route. So you'll fly off on your Sri Lankan passport mm -hmm. to, to another country. But for generally Russia, a lot of Tamils go to Russia, spend time there, and through like uh, a car, a bus, um, they will start going, traveling towards, uh, towards Europe. So mm -hmm. then they'll go to like Poland, to Germany, to France, and then to the UK. So that's the route that my dad took. And it's crazy because like he didn't, obviously didn't know English. Um, he's always had a bit of money and he's in a cold country, like mm -hmm. in a random place in Russia. Right. And, and he just has cash. He just got cash a and he's got a bunch of... cash and gold. <laughs> Probably not a suitcase, but like, uh, like yeah, huge amount of dollars and right. he's carrying around. And, and like, he's, got, he's, him, he's with this, like, other couple of other refugees who are also trying to go to the same journey. So he actually, like, went to Russia and then went to Poland. Then he was in Poland prison for some time because they caught him with no, like, paperwork. Mm -hmm. And then they had to get him out and then he carried on to Germany and then Germany to France and actually from France to uh, To the UK he actually went inside like uh, of a car like illegally wow. So when he got there he, he told them like I come from Sri Lanka. I'm, I'm getting killed there. Yeah. I need a place to stay So then so, that, so, so th that's this like a one. refugee status. Yeah Wow, That's so route wild. one. We took a bit more of a nicer route, which is more along the plane so mm -hmm. from Sri Lanka we left on a Sri Lankan passport. So with Sri Lankan passport, there's only a couple of countries you can go to, mm -hmm. right? So I think we went to India and then to Indonesia. We this is you and your mom? Me, my mom and my brother was born as well. It's, and yeah. how old was your brother at that time? My brother was like only three, four. He was young. Wow. So you were 10. Yeah. Your brother was three or four. Yeah. This is wild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and did your dad help you guys yeah. sort of? Yeah. So he, yeah. he, he paid like an agent mm -hmm. to kind of move us around. So in Indonesia, we arrived there and there was like a house full of like other refugees who were also trying to flee. And, and from, from India to Indonesia, was, did you go by a but, flight? Oh, flight, flight, from right, flight, okay. yeah. right. So that was quite easy to, to, to get through, mm -hmm. just like normally you just pay the, the immigration officer and you just get through. But once you get to Indonesia, now you're trying to get to the next country, which is Thailand. This is where the tricky part comes in. Luckily, in those days, they were just like, like pretty much the, the passports weren't as smart as they are now. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to like, you can change people's photos and you can forge people's like signatures. So mm -hmm. I remember my mom used to find like the, the agent would give us a passport that resembled us as much as possible. And you will have signatures and my mom would sit at, in the evenings trying to like practice a signature. So when they stop us at immigration, she can sign exactly as the one on the passport. And you also need to remember these names. Right. They will start asking you questions. Yeah. And so we used to be like, okay, this is your name till we get to the next destination. Yeah. Just keep remembered, keep remembering. Right. And like my mom used to tell like me and my brother, and we used to like try and remember as much as possible. Like, but we were kids, like we mm -hmm. didn't know what was going on. So that's how we got from yeah, Indonesia to Thailand. Mm -hmm. And Thailand, again, the same story. We'll go to the airport. Sometimes like they'll reject us and we're like, so the thing in back now is so risky and scary. Like we could have ended up in a prison like somewhere, but luckily that wasn't the case. So right. we hopped around until we got to Finland. We got to Finland, we arrived at the airport and like they were quite smart and they realized something was going on. Mm -hmm. um, so it was me, uh, my mom, my brother, and like a couple of other people who were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they caught all of us, mm -hmm. put us in, in the lounge. And be like, you've got to tell us the truth. Like, where do you come from? Right. Who sent you here? Where are you going? What's yeah. the plan? Like, until you own up, we're not going to, like, let you go anywhere. Right. So we were put in the thing. We had no idea, like, where to go. So because I was a kid, I was, I was kind of, like, let out. So I kind of roamed the airport to try and find out what country we were in because we had no idea where we were, like, at that time. So we had no idea. We knew we were somewhere, but, like, in, in an European country. So that took a while. And then we finally said, okay, like, we were scared that if we owned up to traveling illegally, they'll send us back to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even tell them that. So after a day of, like, not really getting anywhere, we owned up that, yeah, this is our story. It's where we come from. Don't send us back. Like, mm -hmm. it's not safe for us to go back. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then, yeah, they put us in a, they were like, that's not a problem, you're welcome here. We'll put you in a refugee camp for now till we find your place mm -hmm. and so on. But the issue was my dad was already in the UK and that mm -hmm. was always the destination. Mm -hmm. So again, from Finland to UK, we had to travel illegally and we got there. It's, but the, how did you go from Finland to the UK? Yeah, so m my dad paid for an agent mm -hmm. um, who came to Finland. We met him at the airport and it was like, the story was that he was the dad and we were like a big family. Mm. So they m somehow he paid one of the immigration officers for us to let, to go through. So we had wow. flight tickets and new passports, mm -hmm. which had the same surname as the agent. Right. So we were able to go through. I think those days things were a lot more, they didn't have facial recognition or right. scanners or anything right. like that. And so when you land, landed in London, mm -hmm. I suppose, you basically said, hey, yeah. we're, we're seeking asylum. We're from Sri Lanka. Yeah. There's a civil unrest. Yeah. So and, and was the British government like... So the way that worked was like when we arrived, so when you're on the plane, you normally like rip up any documentations you have. Mm -hmm. um, because generally, if you land illegally somewhere, they'll send you back to your last location. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really want to go back to Finland. So when we arrived there, we got to immigration. We were like, like they were like, where's your passport? We were like, don't have it. Where do you come from? Don't know. Uh, and then they put you in to like, then they take you to like the proper home office, like the immigration. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, my dad's here already. He's got asylum status here. Mm -hmm. So we're here to join him. So they kept us in a room for like half a day, called my dad and said, your family's arrived. They came, he came and then checked his documentations. Um, and then we like, and then we were let go. But the way you get asylum. So my, from my dad moment he arrived to him getting a, uh, his like mm -hmm. status is you tell the home office like it's not safe I was tortured I was being like it's not safe for me to go back my family is like not safe mm -hmm. um, all the stories of what actually happened the army like coming to search your house and mm -hmm. taking people away and you gotta remember Sri Lanka has one of the highest number of disappearances in the world mm -hmm. people just vanish um, so all these stories about what actually happens you tell the home office Home office will make a decision on whether they can keep you mm -hmm. or to send you back. And my dad's case was rejected. They said, well, we can't really prove that you're a refugee or it's not safe. So then he appealed to high court. And in court, the court said, actually looking at the evidences, it is unsafe for him to go back. There is a, a civil unrest. So he should be given asylum. And that's how he got his status. Wow. And how long did that whole process take? That takes about a year, year and a half. Right. For some people, it can take 20 years. It really depends. And what was your dad doing when he got to the UK and, and, and you know, settled yeah. there? So first, like, my dad started working when he was 13. So he was a tailor from that age. Mm -hmm. So when he arrived in the UK, initially he worked um, like in a factory. So mm -hmm. till you're given like an asylum status, right. there really isn't a huge amount of support that you get from mm -hmm. the government. Like they don't just give you money to like live. So they like tiny bits of support. So you actually have to work, right? Mm -hmm. So he worked in a factory with like where they make clothes. And then once he's got his status, he was like, I, I'm pretty sad. I'm going to open up my store. So he's opened up his shop like within a year of year, year and a half of being there. And then he's bought his house like to a year later and he was set to go. Like, wow. It was like, yeah, the people, like the growth That's of, incredible. it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Like some of the, and I'm thinking, wow, like, he came with nothing, right. barely any English. Right. Set up a cash. business, yeah. bought a house, and brought his family, family over. over. So bought a second house and wow. like set up and ready to go. I mean, that's hustle. That is, I mean, that is incredible <laughs> but by any standards, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, that's one of the stories. I've seen like um, people that come from Sri Lanka, same kind of mm -hmm. um, situation, some worse, some like even better. Like, they come study and they're like now setting up like multi-million um, worth of like businesses right. like Libara and like a prime example. It's a bunch of like Sri Lankan Tamil refugees who are like millionaires and billionaires in the UK or oh, even across the world. Right. And I'm just like, wow, that's like incredible. And sometimes I feel that pressure sometimes because I'm like, I'm being, you know, I didn't come at a much later age. I came quite young. So mm -hmm. I've got more opportunities, more comfort. Right. Sometimes it's so hard to kind of live up to that yeah. and like to, wor to work as hard as they did. But again, like that's, that's what happens, right? The first generation mm -hmm. is super hard working, achieve a lot. 
and over time the generation get a bit more comfortable well so 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 you were 10 mm. when you got to the uk your brother was three or four mm. what happened then like did you go to school and then how did you then end up yeah here? so yeah um went to school in grew up in wembley went to primary school there when I was 16, sorry, no, when I was 14, my parents wanted me to go to a boarding school. Mm -hmm. So I went to study at a boarding school in India, mm -hmm. in Tamil Nadu in Uti. So I spent two years there, amazing experience. Came back to the UK, went to uni there, and then worked in investment banking for two years, did fixed income. And then I worked at a FinTech, um, which, which does invoice finance. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like this is amazing stuff. Like I got here, I worked, I've learned quite a lot. Now I'm kind of ready to set my own thing up. And that's where Go Code came in, came up with an idea to launch a coding school. Mm -hmm. um, that was super fun, four years of super hard work and in really in, in, London, in London, in the UK. Mm -hmm. and then franchise turned out to Qatar. And uh, last year, I've been traveling around Asia quite a bit and I've always wanted to move back to Asia, something a bit more closer to, mm -hmm. to home home. Um, and Singapore was one of the places I was looking at. You know, it's great for startups lot of opportunities, very easy to start businesses mm -hmm. here. Um, so I was like, you know, before this, you know, there was some bits of like hints of COVID blowing mm -hmm. up, but I didn't really see it as a huge threat. So in March 3rd, I moved to Singapore. Right. Yeah. So, so your first entrepreneurial venture mm -hmm. was GoCode, mm -hmm. which is a coding school. Yeah. And um, like, how did that, that idea come about? Because you, uh, it, what did you study accounting. in university? In accounting. Yeah. Investment banking, yeah. Fist, fixed income, fintech. Yeah. How did the coding idea come about? So I think the, the initial, I, the spark of the idea comes from like when I was in Colombo. So I remember that year, year and a half I was spending there. So during that time, my mom used to send me to what they used to call computer classes. Mm -hmm. So after school, I used to go and like play with computers and like do bits on Word, like art and just play games and like learn a few about computers because computers weren't big in the UK, like in Sri Lanka then. Mm -hmm. It's like a new thing and for some reason my mom thought that it could give me something good. So that was my after school activities. So that's what the initial idea was and I've always had this. But when I started going through school, university, and then when I started working in fintech, I realized there's a massive gap in the market for, um, for like tech talent. Tech mm -hmm. talent was so hard to find, especially like good developers, good like data scientists. And for a lot of tech startups and big tech companies, it was so hard to, like, uh, to hire. And I was just curious as to why this is. Surely schools should be pushing kids into taking up computer science at university level or should be pre preparing them to code from an early mm -hmm. age. And I was just curious as to why this is not happening. And then I realized there was a big gap. The government is pushing a lot more on the digital agenda. Mm -hmm. It's the same across the world. More and more governments are pushing more young people to get into mm -hmm. tech um, because there'll be more jobs which will depend on it. And I thought, okay, maybe there is some space here. Let me test something out. Let me just see what I can do mm -hmm. on my part. And I had an idea to start a coding school. I've seen a few in the States, took some inspiration. Mm -hmm. There's a few popping up in the UK, and I thought, why don't I give this a go? I pitched the idea to one of the accelerator programs with Royal Bank of Scotland, mm -hmm. and they were like, they gave me a space on their program for six months, mm -hmm. and that's where it went. Like, I had no idea about what businesses were, how to start a business. Mm -hmm. My only knowledge was from my parents and from working at the fintech startup. Right. So I was like, okay, this is the ideation stage. Let's just test, keep testing. Mm -hmm. So coding school I thought the idea was like going into schools and running classes mm -hmm. did that for like two months and then realized schools don't have a lot of money to pay mm -hmm. so you know I was always conscious about the revenue right like if you don't have revenue coming in you don't have a business mm -hmm. you have a charity right so revenue was so important for me not so that I can fund myself but of course that's important so I can mm -hmm. be stable but also it's important for businesses mm -hmm. if you're not a revenue making business it's mm -hmm. very hard to sustain so I was like, schools don't have money, fine, let's try parents, will parents pay for it? So we started running after school clubs with parents mm -hmm. paying for it. So they started paying, so I was like, how can I get more parents to pay? Then we looked at childcare vouchers. Mm -hmm. So childcare vouchers is given, it's like a government initiative, you can cash in on some of those. Mm -hmm. So revenue started coming in that way, then it was just replication. Like I had one in Milton Keynes, a couple of set up in like in London, mm -hmm. Bedford, it was just replication after that. And how many 
so I'm guessing these are physical schools. Yeah. So you have a space, students come, and, and uh, they spend do, a couple yeah. hours as instructors. Yeah, yeah. And how many centers did you end up? So opening? I had about five centers in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and this was at, at the peak. And then we were approached by a company in Qatar to set up one there, mm -hmm. so which I franchised to. So it was like six altogether. And it was like super, super fun. Mm -hmm. I hit a roadblock at the end of like four years because I've been working on it for a while. It's not, where, not as big as I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. I've learned a huge amount, but I had to really think about like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still young, I still got so much energy. How much more energy and time do I want to dedicate to this? How much do I care about it? And, um, and how much potential does it actually have in mm -hmm. terms of growth? So I thought about all these things and you know things started slowing down a little bit and then covid came and so i had to kind of like take a step back from it so the qatar one is still running mm -hmm. so i still have something that i built and it's still right. running and it's still teaching loads of kids right. which i'm proud of but i want to do something uh, something else mm -hmm. i think it was time for a change i had a bunch of ideas and that's how when i moved to singapore i was dabbling with a lot of ideas right i signed up to startup week in singapore which I ended up winning with the team, mm -hmm. which was great. And then I met my co-founder here, like we were living together in Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And then we started Boxeroo because we realized there was a gap in the market for, right. for merchandise. Right. Um, yeah, so that's how Boxeroo started and yeah. my different ventures. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so going back to uh, um, the coding school, is that still the one in the UK? Is it still running or did you shut the, the, it down? The, the UK one is shut down just because I'm not likely to go back to the UK for a while. The one in Qatar is still running. Mm -hmm. And I think towards the, the, the final year of GoCode, like I really tried to find all sorts of ways to really scale it. Mm -hmm. um, even the online school we were running for a little bit, it worked, it had some potential, but it didn't really grow. I think the timing would, was, wasn't right. right. So the huge takeaway from that was trying to find like, the timing has got to be right mm -hmm. for, for tech. Right. Is the market kind of ripe to adopt this kind of technology in the way of learning? Um, and also like when, you know, for me on my next venture when I'm thinking about things, always thinking about scalability right from the beginning and also think, being more realistic about what your expectations with this business is. Mm -hmm. Like what are you looking to do? Is it money? Is it growth? Is it scale? Mm -hmm. And is it, going, is it likely to get you there? Are you likely to achieve that kind of scale? Um, and again, looking at scalability of a business, like you might have an idea which is great, but trying to understand that sometimes these business ideas you come up with mm -hmm. is heavily dependent on you as the founder right like when it comes to scaling you'll struggle yeah and I've seen that quite a bit so all my businesses now like anything ideas I come up with I have a like a, a radar which mm -hmm. will start kind of filtering down ideas very quickly right so it seems like go code was a success yeah right it yeah. was it was a success and you decided hey I want to do something else you wanted to come to Asia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you were kind of done with the UK. Yeah. And now Boxeroo is your second yeah. entrepreneurial yeah. venture. Yeah. So I mean, I've had a bunch of failure ones. Right. Well, along. let's- like Small little uh -huh. ideas. I had a, um, like an e-commerce like mm -hmm. platform um, before. I had a recruitment platform. This was my first one while I was having a full-time mm -hmm. job matching like um, recruiters with companies. Mm -hmm. Again, built everything, got excited, built everything, started getting people in, nobody wanted to use <laughs> it. <laughs> Don't build anything and, until, until you're validated you know the idea. That people that want was, this. Yeah, yeah. Right. Had that. Um, I did some Airbnb stuff like so, I think two like year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a flat in, in Wembley Stadium. Mm -hmm. So like I did that, like I just, well, overnight I, was, I wasn't like, sometimes I was, in, in as founders, you get so many sleepless nights, right? Like mm -hmm. I, sometimes I can't sleep because I'm buzzing with ideas. It's like this Airbnb could be a potential. My flat's like big. I'm not really mm -hmm. using it as much. I'm traveling most of the time. Why don't I list it? I listed it, woke up in the morning and I had like shit ton of booking. I was right. like, oh, okay. And I did that for like a year, just like checking people in, checking yeah. people out, doing yeah. cleaning, made an absolute killing. Yeah. Uh, and then COVID and it yeah. all kind of went down. So a yeah. bunch of different ideas. It's, yeah. it's always fun to like. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you seem like a very, very entrepreneurial mm. person with lots of ideas and you test them out and you execute. So maybe this then, then leads us to your current venture, which is Boxeroo. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a bit about how the idea came about, what you're thinking in terms of the opportunity 
uh, you're just getting started, mm -hmm. and what's sort of the plan yeah. for the yeah. company? Yeah. So during the lockdown, me and my co-founder, we, we live together at, at Hamlet. We're exploring a bunch of ideas. Um, and, and some of the things we were looking at was remote like working. There's a lot more people working from home. Mm -hmm. How do companies, like how are companies keeping the work culture going yeah. while people are so like dispersed in different parts of the country or different parts of the world? How do they keep that company culture going? How do they make sure that employees feel part of the company and the mission and they're still motivated. So we were thinking about a bunch of different ideas like and we had a housemate who worked at Goldman Sachs um, and he had like a new table, a new screen, mm -hmm. like a full setup sent to him. And we were like, how do these how do these companies kind of move these things around very quickly? What's the whole process? Um, and then we, we 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 realized like let's spend a bit more time on on, on dabbling around this. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the, the kind of merchandise market, we looked at the logistics market. In terms of merchandise, we realized it was so old school. So for company like office managers or people's operations and marketing people to go and print a t-shirt and ship it out to their employees was super mm -hmm. difficult. You have to go on Google search, find a couple of companies, right. call them up, email them, yep. or you go to, go to like Taobao or one of these platforms. Mm -hmm super painful mm -hmm. and in none of these companies that we came across had a proper site you couldn't really there was right. no visuals you had no idea what you're buying what you're paying mm -hmm. so we wanted to kind of streamline all of this um, and that's what we did we just set up a very basic site and said look this is what it's going to look like mm -hmm. we're going to have a platform where you can go and upload your logo see previews choose a number of items you with the quantities you want the sizes you can see exactly how much you're paying and you can have it within a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Super, you can add, do all this process within a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. We sent it out to businesses we knew and we started getting orders straight away. We're like, we'd love to, to, to work with you guys. Right. And the second aspect of it was the branding and, and the kind of like the aesthetic that we went with. Super mm -hmm. clean, super easy, huge importance and you, you know, user experience and interface. And those things, those are the two parts that we, you know, we really focused on. Mm -hmm. And it was, the, the business is very simple. We just want to make it easier and simpler for yeah. people to order merchandise. Yeah. No, I, I love yeah. it. I'm, I'm <laughs> waiting for the hats to yeah. come on yeah. so I can <laughs> order some hats. But that's great. Yeah. So, so you, I, I mean, clearly the opportunity is terrific. And we were talking about this uh, some other time, yeah. but there's companies doing this in other parts of the world, yeah. but yeah. in this part of the world, yeah. it seems like it's, um, it's not being done. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's fantastic. And um, I know you have to run. So you seem like a really, really positive, mm -hmm. energetic, optimistic, happy person. Yeah. Yeah. But you have this crazy life journey of being a refugee, yeah. hopping around the world, going to a new country, <laughs> and you were ten. So I'm guessing yeah. you have memories yeah. of, of of that. And I, I guess anyone that goes through that, yeah. it's a sounds like a very traumatic yeah. traumatic yeah. experience. Now that you're really you know trying these entrepreneurial yeah. ventures, mindset is such an important thing. Yeah. How have you overcome your past yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know become like this super optimistic, yeah. <laughs> happy person? I think it's something um, I think it's something that like that's always going to stick with me. Mm. And it's the same for all the other kids who are born around the same time as me, whether they're born during the war in Sri Lanka or they were born in the diaspora in the other countries, but you know their families. Trauma gets passed on to generations. Like, mm -hmm. even if you weren't born there or weren't connected to it, you will still feel it. And 2009 was like a big chunk, like it was probably one of the toughest years for me. I was doing my A-levels um, and the final stages of the war was going on. There was a genocide that took place in Sri Lanka. And all this trauma, it just keeps coming back to me. Like every time I meet someone and they're like, oh, like, where are you from? Uh, I'm like from, from Sri Lanka and they're like, oh, it's such a lovely place. The beaches mm -hmm. are amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a great surf spot. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's a trigger point and so hard like because mm -hmm. I don't want to ruin this conversation right. of like giving me, giving you a story about how it's not the case. Mm -hmm. for, you know, it's a great spot for tourism and it's amazing. It's a beautiful country for tourists, right? But for the ethnic Tamils who've gone through this trauma, it's not, it's not really been a pleasant uh, thing for me. So 
I try and be like, yeah, it's like it's great, but like you know, I don't really come from that background. We've had a war going on, so things weren't great. And I le- usually leave it at that mm-hmm. because I don't want to kind of like get upset by it. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is like on when I hear news or um, times when things are you know sometimes I have down times mm-hmm. and I think back I'm like like I could have still been on the island stuck there with not much opportunities or I could have been killed in the war but I'm here now so like just make the most of it and when I speak to younger people like in in my community but also outside of the Tamil community in the UK or even in Singapore and people message me on like Instagram like you're so positive you have a lot going for you like I'm starting my own business like mm-hmm. how do you, what are your advice and I tell them two things the first one being like just think about where you are right like mm-hmm. I have a British passport now. You have a Singaporean passport now. Mm-hmm. If things don't go well for you, try this idea. It doesn't work. It fails miserably. Mm-hmm. What's the worst? Like mm-hmm. you've got a massive safety net. You can right. get a job. The government will support you. Right. So you should really take that opportunity to really go hard and explore and do as much as you can, and especially when you're young. Second part is like not giving up. It's like having a structured idea. and being super positive that it's going to work because mm. i think back to my parents who like left sri lanka with just hope like mm. i hope i can get my kids to a safe country they had no idea where they were going they had no guarantee that was going to work they left with hope and i always think back to like when i'm starting something um, i have hope that it's going to work and i'm going to do everything in my power to make sure it does so those are the two most important things and that's how i try not to think about the past so much mm-hmm. i try and look at ways to contribute back to my community but looking forward it's like just be positive take the most of the opportunities now you can't change the past but you have the opportunity to right. do what you want now right incredible <laughs> incredible story i'm super <laughs> inspired by by your story but also your outlook yeah. and your positivity and and sort of just how you reconcile um you know your your past with your future mm. All right, this is an amazing episode. <laughs> if you um you know Robert f- fled a, a genocide and and civil unrest um went to the UK as a refugee and look how he turned out. <laughs> turned out amazing. Um uh, building an awesome company. I actually really like it. Yeah. If you need branded merchandise for your company, boxeroo.co. Yeah. Uh correct. that's where you can um buy things for your company. So check it out. And Thank this has been so really much. really really inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.